Good evening, esteemed colleagues, practitioners, and attendees, both here at the iconic Ropsham Theater at Boston College and those who are joining us online via Zoom. We have two communities today that are part of the Psych and the Other conference. One is Psych and the Other, which started today, and the other is the uh, lecture by the Center for Psychological Humanities. And those of you who are joining us today online, we have instructions on the chat that is active that you can follow. My name is Sunil Bhatia, and I'm a professor of human development at Connecticut College. I am both the moderator and a respondent for today's keynote. It is an honor to welcome you to this year's Psychology and Other Conference and the opening keynote address titled On Care in Mental Health, Suffering, Healing and Human Condition by Professor Arthur Kleinman. We convey today in a time at the ethos of care and appreciation for the beautiful complexity of the human condition is being written out of our medical and psychological education in favor of managed care standards that prioritize our relationship to capital or our responsibility to people. The recent global struggles, including the pandemic, have amplified the calls for introspection, critique, and transformation in the field of mental health. This conference, as it has since inception in 2011, provides a unique space for such vital dialogue, one that bridges psychology with philosophy, theology, and the wider humanities. It calls us to understand, empathize with, and respond to the other, to challenges, to challenge the insular boundaries of the discipline, and to serve those marginalized and othered by the society. Our distinguished keynote speaker tonight is Professor Arthur Kleinman, MD, RAP Professor of Anthropology at Harvard University and Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine and Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. An intellectual tour de force, Professor Kleinman has profoundly influenced fields from medical anthropology to global health and the medical humanities. His work underscores the chasm between medical advancements and the lived experiences of those uh, who are navigating illness and care. Kleinman is a sole author of seven books, including The Illness Narrative, Rethinking Psychiatry, What Really Matters, and The Soul of Care. He's a co-author of four others and co-editor of 29 other volumes, including Social Suffering, Culture and Depression, and World Mental Health. Arthur Kleinman has also authored or co-authored over 350 journal articles and book chapters and was the founding editor in chief of culture, medicine and psychiatry from 1976 to 1986. Kleinman has been the recipient of many awards, prizes, named lectureships. I'll just mention a few as the list is very long. He has received the Welcome Medal of Royal Anthropological Institute, the Franz Boas Award of the American Anthropological Association, the Doubleday Award, the Tanner Lecture, the Hume Lecture, the Ming Fisher Lecture, the William James Lecture, and there are many others that you can see in his profile on his website. He has supervised, while doing all of that, over 100 PhD students, 25 of whom are MD PhDs, 50 MA students, and 200 postdoctoral fellows. Tonight's presentation is drawn from Professor Kleinman's paper co-authored with Dr. Caleb Gardner in the upcoming issue of Deadless on Mental Health, and it promises to be a deep exploration into the future of mental health care. Together, they scrutinize a rapidly evolving landscape, emphasizing the reimagining of mental health and medicine in light of technological, therapeutic, and societal shifts. Our panel of respondents further enriches our dialogue tonight. Uh, Dr. Zenobia Morel, who uh, will be our first respondent, is an assistant professor in the clinical psychology department at William James College and is a senior research associate of the Center for Psychological Humanities and Ethics at Boston College. She completed a clinical internship and postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University School of Me Medicine and received a doctorate in counseling psychology from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Her research interests are focused in psychotherapy, qualitative inquiry, critical psychology, and decolonial perspectives. These topics extend into areas related to broader conceptual and ethical issues in the field that engage social determinants of health and human rights. 
Her work on liberation psychotherapy and dedication to social justice offers profound insights into the intersection of therapy, culture, and justice. Dr. Caleb Gardner is a board certified psychiatrist in Cambridge, practicing in Massachusetts, New York, and Maine. He's affiliated with Cambridge Health Alliance. In a recent commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine, he, along with Dr. Kleinman, issued a clarion call to the field writing that psychiatry, and I quote them, psychiatry finds itself plagued by overprescription of psychiatric medication for a large segment of population, abandonment and incarceration, incarceration of people with chronic severe mental illness, and an increasingly unwieldy diagnostic system of overlapping symptoms uh, checklists. So after the respondents, there are two, and I will go, uh, I'll be the third respondent. Following the presentations, we will engage in a rich dialogue with our panelists, and we invite you and our audience to participate in this collective conversation about the work we do and the work we are called to do differently. So to all attendees together, let's use that, this our time at this conference to deepen our understanding of the human experience with compassion and connection and realize our shared goals to understand more deeply, to challenge constructively, and to transform our field ethically. So without further ado, please join me in warming and warmly welcoming Professor Arthur Kleinman. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, let's get the ball rolling. So. Um, I am both an anthropologist and a psychiatrist. And anthropology is interested basically in global diversity. And psychiatry is almost interested in the opposite, which is how to discover what is abidingly human and um, engageable in the experiences of people all over the world. That's led psychiatry to be have a uh, an Achilles heel, which was the failure to understand culture, and it's led anthropology to be so interested in diversity that it's failed to see what unifies all of us. And tonight, I hope to bring the two together in the same way that um, my work tries to bring biology and society together. So I'm going to talk about care in mental health. And it's drawn from a 2019 book of mine, The Soul of Care. This book was uh, published by Penguin and uh, widely reviewed and, um, uh, and I've given many lectures on this topic. Now the book is both a memoir uh, and a uh, analysis of caregiving. Uh, and here you can see my attempt to uh, provide an image of what the book tries to do. You see in the first image to your left, the rod of Asclepius, which is a wing staff with a snake wound about it. That's the symbol of medicine coming out of the Greek medical tradition. But actually, in my view, it's the wrong symbol of medicine when it comes to caregiving. What would be a much better symbol for medicine is the caduceus of Hermes or Mercury, which is also a wing staff, but this time with two serpents wound around the staff, with the emphasis on reciprocity, on the back and forth between family and patient, between patient and doctor, between doctor and doctors, etc. And the other source of the talk tonight is an issue of the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It's called Daedalus, which is um, edited by me on uh, mental health. It will appear on November 15th, it has 14 articles. And those articles s seek to look at mental health um, in such a way that a social medicine perspective, an understanding of how the social plays a big role in illness and in treatment is the focus. Um, 
Now, to talk about what the book covers, I have to be personal, and, um, and uh, this is me in 1965 with my uh, wife who died in, of um, early onset Alzheimer's disease, Joan, okay? And we were in, I was at Stanford Medical School. She was at, she was a China scholar at Hoover Institution at Stanford. And, um, and this was our, one of our pictures from that time. Um, and this is Joan and I when I was training at the Massachusetts General Hospital in, in Boston and as a psychiatrist. And Joan was um, uh, uh, doing her classical Chinese at Harvard. And this is Joan in uh, early midlife. This is uh, me together with Joan in midlife. This is Joan a little later on in midlife. And yet again uh, in midlife. And this is Joan in our garden in Cambridge uh, in 19, when she was 58 years of age in, um, at the end of the 1990s. And her early onset Alzheimer's was just starting. This is Joan well along in her Alzheimer's disease, which lasted for 11 years, and she died in uh, 2011. This was Joan on, our, um, on her deathbed. Um, uh, I took care of her for 10 years, and in the last uh, eight months of her life, she uh, was in a nursing home, a great nursing home, Newbridge on Charles, in Dedham. And at the end, uh, this is about a day before she died, um, she only had one word, and that word was my name, Arthur. And this is uh, a picture of her grave in uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery. You can see that her, my adult children and I and our grandchildren try to sum up who Joan was. And it's, you, you can see our attempt to do that beauty wisdom, goodness, above all love. And this is also a picture of a part of the bereavement that I've gone through in regarding to relation to care. This is my late great former student colleague, Paul Farmer, who uh, was well known to the BC campus I went to Paul's memorial uh, at the, uh, the Jesuit chapel last year here. It was a lovely memorial service. And Paul was the icon of care in global health. Um, and this is the two of us together. Um, we, taught, we taught many courses together. And um, this was for a, uh, a, um, one of them. Now, the soul of caregiving. So by soul, I meant the, the foundation, the, the core. And, and here we see uh, first relationships and reciprocity. So my argument is that cross-culturally, if you look at caregiving in societies, you cannot define a society that does not have caregiving. They may vary in the attention they give to it, in the way it's carried out, in the support, in the systems, but caregiving is part of the human experience. And crucial to it is that it is relational, that it is reciprocal, that it occurs not just uh, between two people, but in a social context. That's a family, a network, a community. And that those sets of relationships are critical to what care and caregiving is, including the relationship with professionals. The other dimension of care, which I think is important, and that we see, again, almost a um, global aspiration for, though not always easy to achieve, is the presence of the caregiver often described by, uh, in family settings, as being drawn out of the caregiver by the recipient of care. And that presence is, is, for us, 
something um, that, since many of you are, are involved with uh, therapy or psychotherapy or care of some sort, or have had the, the experience in your families, that presence is that liveliness brought forth out of us when we're with people who mean something deeply for us. The question is, how do you have that presence also in a clinical relationship when healthcare systems in many societies, ours especially, do just about everything to make it difficult for that presence to emerge? Caregiving is also about rituals and habits. Um, so I couldn't possibly have taken care of Joan for 10 years w without ritualizing my care, so that organizing the day in the way we did the day. Uh, Alzheimer's was particularly cruel to Joan because it started in the occipital lobes of her brain and spread forward so that it began with blindness and then became dementia. That happens in about 5% of cases of Alzheimer's disease. But organizing rituals and habits is critical to being able to get through every day. Um, and again, I could take you all over the world and show you the importance of rituals and habits in the caregiving provided um, by people virtually everywhere. Now here's something that you don't usually see. And since I'm speaking to a group that has a lot of psychologists, I wanna be very frank with you and tell you that um, I don't believe in resilience. I think resilience is bullshit, okay? It's, it's from Hollywood, it's from Hollywood. None of us are resilient, none of us. You point a person to me, let me speak to them and I'll show you that we, none of us are resilient, okay? Because resilience has the simplistic American pop psychology idea that each of us is a rubber band that you can extend as wide as you can. But take that rubber band, put it in your uh, kitchen window, let the sun hit it for a day or two. And when you try to expand it, it becomes brittle and it breaks. And that's all of us. So taking care of Joan for me broke me. And taking care of seriously ill people mental illness, all kinds of physical illness from diabetes to heart disease to cancer breaks people. Now we as professionals have to recognize that. Sometimes it breaks us. And we know we recognize that in ourselves, but almost always it's breaking family members. And hence the issue is how do you endure? How do you endure? Endurance is really what care is about for chronic illness, for disability, um, for uh, uh, dementia. So the question is, how do we endure? How do we keep going? What helps us to keep going? I'm gonna argue very briefly that uh, care is a human development process. I have four grandkids. It's almost like an experiment. Two are male, two are female, okay? They're all in college right now. Um, they were raised beautifully by their parents, but in distinct ways that represent American society, the influence of American society. The girls were raised to be careful. The boys, in the early part of their life, to be wantonly careless, okay? That's part of what American society is. That's the socialization toward some of our central virtues and some of our central fa failures. That's socialization toward macho masculinity. That's socialization toward women being the caregivers, which is a tremendous cop-out by men in our society and in many societies. All over the world, women are the central caregivers. And all over the world, families are where most of care is given. Most care, not just for depression, anxiety, psychosis, et cetera, but for every illness you can name, is given primarily in families. 
What professionals do is added on, is crucial often, but is not where most of care is given. So how do we develop in such a way that women are giving the care in our society and men fail to step up to the responsibilities of care? If we look in professional settings like hospitals, nursing homes, clinics, who gives most of the care? Who gives most of the real hands-on care? Not doctors, not nurses, nursing assistants, health aides, home health aides. Who are they? Who are they in American society? They are poor women of color, principally. In Boston, they're Haitian women, okay? Irish women, but Irish women from poor families, okay? They're women from the Philippines, women from many different societies, and they take on a job, let's say home health aides, or aides in the hospital or in a nursing home that is of low prestige, of low pay, and is backbreaking. Okay? As soon as they get the chance to leave that job and go somewhere else, they go. What's the turnover rate of nursing homes in the United States? It's almost 100% a year. Okay? Because none of us could endure that work for much longer, given the pay, the difficulty of the work, and the uh, demands that are made. I'm going to talk briefly about barriers, and then I want to talk, just say a few words about caring for memories. So care does not end when a person dies. It doesn't end for the family, and it doesn't end for the professional caregivers. Every psychologist, every physician who's ever taken care of seriously ill patients who've passed away remembers. And that memory is curated amongst the set of memories that we have. Professionally, that caring for memories is critical to the way that we develop as uh, professional healers. But in families, that's the essence of bereavement and mourning. What is mourning? It is the caring for memories. And it begins and continues. It begins before people die, and it continues after they die. Now, the core tasks of caregiving, I don't have much time for, and, um, but you, can, you, you know these. So the fundamental uh, ethicists tell us that the fundamental ethical act is the acknowledgment and affirmation of the patient amongst professionals or in the family or amongst strangers as deserving of care. That act uh, that we deserve care is our recognition of our ethical obligation. It's practical assistance. The work of caring for people who are near the end of life, people with serious dementia, um, with all the neuro uh, degenerative disorders, with end-stage renal failure, heart failure, cancer. is about feeding, bathing, ambulating, toileting, protecting. Care is about emotional support, about moral solidarity and responsibility. What do I mean by moral solidarity? Was, I gave a lecture uh, like this to a, um, at the University of, of uh, um, uh, Stockholm a few years ago, and the Lutheran, uh, uh, the head of Lutheran Church of Stockholm happened to be there. And he said, oh, I know exactly what you mean by moral solidarity, because sometimes I go to the, as, to the house of one of my parishioners who's in a coma. They have no idea I'm there, but I'm there to represent uh, our, religious by, uh, uh, our religious ties. Um, whether the person knows it or not, the family knows it. Um, let, me, let me move ahead a little more uh, fully. Care and caring, as I mentioned, as uh, uh, human development, let's parse the word care a little bit. So it begins with the idea of 
something that's significant for us. We care about it. We learn that. We learn what to care about. Again, if you were to look at the gender divides in societies, you'll see the different ways that men and women are socialized to what is really what really matters with respect to what they care about, what's important for them. We're at a time when people are talking about mature masculinity uh, and femininity, and clearly part of mat mature masculinity is redefining masculinity in light of care, that that burden of caregiving must be shared. Over time as people age, lived expressions of gender difference become less pronounced. And long ago, Eric Erickson pointed out very clearly that in the final stage of life, when we seem to be involved in engendering the lives of others, care becomes a much more important element. Now, challenges to caregiving are many, and they differ across the world, OK? Um, in our society, I'll just list some for, for our society. There's a crisis in long-term funding, long-term care funding. Can I ask uh, you, how many people in the audience have long-term care insurance? Put your hand up. OK, it's a minority of people in the audience. Insurance companies don't want to write long-term care insurance. It's expensive, and most Americans, the vast number of Americans, do not have it. Um, I had it, and my wife had it. And in the last member, I remember I said the last eight months of her life, she went into a, a great nursing home. Um, that long-term care insurance paid $50,000 toward the course of that nursing home. No one who, ha who did not have, anyone who did not have long-term care insurance couldn't possibly have afforded that nursing home. Okay? As it was, just to give you a sense of what may be ahead for you, to think seriously about things. It cost me $150,000 to provide the rest of the care for that eight months while she was in um, a nursing home. That cost $200,000 for eight months. So if you don't have that, um, you're going into a system in which uh, just before Joan had to go into a nursing home, my adult children and I went and looked at 22 nursing homes in the Boston area. 10 of them were appalling, just appalling. You wanted to cry when you left the nursing home. You saw people who were um, wearing um, hospital clothes that were soiled, yelling out or with their hands in the air because there was no nursing aid coming to them to help them. Um, and the situation in many areas of the world is actually worse. I do a lot of my research in Chinese society, and I can just tell you that many nursing homes in China are also appalling, except for the ones that, again, are oriented toward high-end uh, individuals who have high-end incomes. Now, if we were Japanese, Finns, Norwegians, Swedes, Germans, Dutch, we would have long-term care provided by our National Health Service, okay? Um, we don't have that. Increasing numbers of people are entering the workforce, hence who's left at home to care for people in our society. That becomes an enormous problem. What kept me going, what kept me enduring during the time I took care of Joan was um, having a home health aide, a wonderful woman, an Irish woman, Irish Catholic woman, who gave, gave great care to my wife and was there, as she said to me once, you work five, from 5 p.m. during the week to 9 in the morning, and I work from 9 to 5, five days a week, and then you also work on the weekend. But I couldn't possibly have cared for Joan if I didn't have someone uh, working at home who allowed me to go to work and do my own research and teaching, keep myself sane and keep going. Um, 
So one of the issues today is who's, who's at home to care for elderly people? Um, a challenge to values of family caregiving in a society that is so caught up in a hyper-individualistic understanding of um, what our values are about. So the, those values um, make it difficult to, um, to in, encourage and inculcate attitudes toward care. Our, our economic system, our neoliberalism, um, makes it difficult for us to do this because the emphasis is not on care. It's on institutional efficiency. All the hospitals you see in the Boston area, we have great hospitals, right? We do, I can tell you that. They all argue that they give high quality care. We don't measure quality of care. What we measure is institutional efficiency. How X number of patients move at Y speed with U outcome through a system. We could measure some of the qualities of care, communication, uh, um, our emotional relationships. After all, these are measured carefully in psychotherapy for certain kinds of psychotherapy, but none of that is done systematically in our society, for regular routine care. Okay. The, there's courtesy stigma. We all know that in the mental health field. Uh, the stigma associated with mental illness, which fortunately has so declined in our time for depression and anxiety disorders, is still a very real thing in this society for psychosis and carries over to the caregivers, the family caregivers and the professional caregivers. And the knowledge needs and communication gaps. So think about this for a minute. If you've had a family member who was an adult in the family and has had 20 years of diabetes and you're a family, set of family members who take care of that individual. Why do you need to go to a physician or a nurse to get a prescription refill? You know as much as they do for that disorder. It's astonishing how much families know about the treatment. You should have even more knowledge given to you and the opportunity to do the prescribing yourself. This is, I believe, what's going to happen in the future as we democratize our care system. Knowledge needs and communication gaps will increasingly put things out into the community to be done by community members who can demonstrate that they're competent at doing it. Professional um, barriers, limited time for interacting with patients. In a primary care visit in the United States, What's the average length of a primary care visit? Anyone here know? Yeah. 11 minutes. Okay. Yeah. 11 minutes. Of that 11 minutes, how much time does the patient have in the first primary care visit before the doctor begins the medical interrogation? 17 seconds. Okay. We know that the, often for patients because of anxiety, in general medical settings, primary care settings, the most important complaint to them is not the initial complaint, but the third complaint. Okay? It's usually the thing that you say as you go out of the doctor's office, oh, by the way, did you see this, um, this coloration in my skin? Is that a, a melanoma by any chance? Um, uh, that you can't complain of that in 17 seconds. So in general medical care, in primary care in our country, the compression of time is so severe that it's almost impossible to take into account the context richly or do the kinds of things I've gone over that are part of caregiving. And the same thing in a way is, is an issue in mental health, though it, at a different stage, a different level, because we have generally more time. Electronic technologies have become barriers, even though they're meant to be helpful 
and they should be helpful, and they will be helpful. Take the electronic medical record. That was actually developed with the idea that would link records from different clinical settings. Doesn't happen. In many places, can happen. So what's the use of the electronic medical record? Billing. Its main use is for billing. But what does it do? It occupies the, it absorbs the attention of the doctor and she has her back turned to the patient when the patient comes into the room, not to do the acknowledging and affirming, that's the first ethical act of care, but to be able to figure out what the hematocrit electrolytes um, cardiac situation is in that, um, in that uh, space of, uh, of computer space. There's no reason that electronic technologies cannot be um, organized in such a way as to be very helpful. And during COVID, we've seen in the mental health field that, um, that the use of uh, tele-technologies um, can be very useful. Um, but they also bring with them some problems that I don't have time uh, to go into. Last of all, in the professional domain, there are weakened incentives for quality care. Uh, I've already talked about measuring care. Uh, so I'm just going to say this and, and run through it since I think it's, it, we're getting close to the end. In fact, why don't I drop this because this is usually what I talk about in medical schools. Um, so what can be done? What can be done? Um, on the um, familial side, well, we can make long-term care insurance available. We can make compensation for family care. Family carers of the chronically ill, the disabled, and the elderly are what keeps our medical system from breaking down entirely. If 10% of family care stopped today, our medical system would be paralyzed by those individuals entering the medical, the professional medical system. So we should provide compensation for family care. Improving cognitive and social supports for families, just as I mentioned earlier, so they can have access to the medications that are needed that they've learned over decades how to use. Professionally, strengthening the moral training of professional caregivers. To see mental health field and the health field generally involved in moral acts, in acts that matter deeply, being trained to that moral orientation. Improving core caregiving skills that I've reviewed here, incentivizing caregiving in da daily practice, and complementing the economic language which all of us as clinicians have allowed to dominate care with the language of care. Let me just pass these. So um, this is the last uh, uh, set of slides I want to show. But let, let me make the let me say what I just said at, at, uh, uh, again. This is it's it's the it's the um, crux of my argument. Our healthcare system needs to be centered on care. Care is the most important part of the healthcare system. Not efficiency, not the economics, but care itself. We need a moral movement for care, similar to the movement for uh, HIV AIDS in the late 80s and early 90s, which changed so much in our society. Now, I just want to make one point here, that we are socialized to scarcity in terms of care. We're constantly told, especially when we look to poor domains in our society and poor parts of the world, that these people who are so poor, they cannot get the kind of care that you and I receive. We should find this unacceptable, okay? 
My, uh, uh, my former student, the late Paul Farmer, said that it's always possible to mobilize resources. And he did that in the poorest places in the world, in Haiti, in West Africa, in Malawi, in Lesotho. Okay. We can do it here. So um, we need a moral movement for care. And my general recommendations are to recognize the anti-care biases of our time, the, develop advocacy and community work to generate this moral movement, and develop the legal and policy interventions that will support family care and social care. Every one of you who's a professional caregiver will be benefited, augmented, when family care is strengthened. So the recommendations for medicine, and here read clinical psychology as well, community psychology, any field of care, are to change the educational process to emphasize the centrality of care. Change the healthcare system so that it allows care to be practiced and respond to burnout. So everyone hears about burnout today. 50% of physicians claim burnout. What is burnout? I think from my perspective, burnout is classical Marxist alienation. It's people with high aspirations who feel their hands are tied behind their back to give what they've been trained to do. And I think this carries over into the mental health field as well. So, um, I'll end with this. Aristotle, in his famous ethics, wrote, moral excellence comes about as a result of habit. We become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts. And I argue we become caring and caregiver caregivers by doing acts of care and caregiving. You are, many of you, professional caregivers. The centerpiece of what you do is care. Your life is filled with all the difficulties every one of us face to make a living, to build a career, take care of family and the like. But when you are at work, it is care that's the centerpiece of what you do. And that's where the emphasis has to be, just like it has to be in the family setting. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. And wow, there's there's so much here to react to in what you're saying um, in this address tonight, but also in your book and in the Daedalus paper. Uh, there's so many all-encompassing themes that are also just very human that I want to react to, but I only have so much time. And I'm compelled to think about really how vital caregiving is to what we speaking as a psychologist, purport to be doing. And if not caring, then what are we really about? In response, I just wanna highlight some ideas in this conversation and what they brought up in me. First, caregiving as a reciprocal way of relating and how the absence of this robust type of care dynamic contributes in my view to many different types of alienation as you were just speaking to with burnout. On the other hand, a caring way of relating bears much potential for needed change. Really caring means engaging institutional and theoretical humility that allows us to rethink our field. For example, Dr. Kleinman, you shared in so many ways how Joan's presence was an effective agent of change for you that reshaped you. As you wrote in your book, The Soul of Care, she softened me and at the same time opened up new ways for me to be me. In this way, first you articulate what care is. Care is a type of presence, a consistently responsive way of being that heals by opening up new ways to be. 
And indeed, I think this is what good psychotherapy is, an encounter that refashions subjectivities toward liberatory possibilities. The existential nature of care that you emphasize is also clearly realized in care's most practical elements, feeding, dressing, toileting, and emotionally comforting someone in dire distress. But there was something more to what you're saying. You trouble these commonplace assumptions by raising questions like who is giving the care and who is receiving it? You and Joan, doctor and patient. In many ways, it wasn't so distinct that care actually is a reciprocal encounter. It is not just a way of being, but a way of relating, I think. One opens themselves up to what is happening between in the interaction and one changes in response. In this way, caregiving can be a site of transformation. From caring through caring, we can change. But this transformative potential, of course, is stultified in the crisis of care. Caregiving is sullied when it is mechanized, individualized, or even romanticized into buzzwords of resilience, neoliberal notions of self-care, or doctors myopically oriented interrogations to get to the bottom of what is wrong with you. When care is reduced in these ways, calculated into burden metrics or dismissed altogether by the medical fields, caregiving's multifaceted and exquisite necessary components are eclipsed. And in the absence of care, we see alienation. Alienation as self and other estrangement, as Arthur and Caleb wrote, in their Daedalus paper, in order not to know what one cannot bear to know, one must amputate their whole apparatus for knowing and feeling new things. So yes, care is a risk. It hinges on the vulnerability to know, feel, and access other ways of being. Alienation also as existential disconnection from meaning and purpose. If care is a way of relating, it is a reminder also of our interconnectedness. Alienation as powerlessness in unjust economic, racial, and political systems. As you write, often medical symptoms symbolize social and political traumas. And alienation in the face of rapidly evolving technologies that risk concretizing power and in structures, including those of inequality. The slippery slope into alienating dehumanization, objectification, and exploitation are anathema to the type of care you advocate for. I then ask, what and who have we collectively amputated from our social psyche? And I think that the stakes of such a disavowal include the repudiation not only of care and our capacity to care, but of our humanity as one and the same. My third and final point is that if psychology is to really care in this polyvalent way, as you've described it, then it must open itself up to this reciprocal integration and change to see what it could not bear to know in order to respond differently. Who has psychology cared for and who's done the caring? Who has been forgotten and abjected by systems and medical curricula? And finally, whose knowledge has shaped theory and practice and what counts as the evidence base that informs caregiving treatment? To engage genuine care then is to be open to change and perhaps mainstream psychology has been resistant to care and the change that this requires. I could see it as inviting diverse explanatory models that appreciate the tacit elements of human experiences inclusion of lived experience and marginalized epistemology as veritable evidence that informs how to better care. A decolonial shift in the psychological canon, particularly around the theory used to shape how care is understood and provided, and to embrace ways of relating that unsettle the objectification and exploitation of land, nature, and persons. A care process is needed to engage not only responses to individuals, but toward environmental, geopolitical, and economic justice as they occur in tandem. I see care as the means and ends to transforming relationships, practices, and systems. The stakes of this crisis include nothing short of actualizing our humanity and the liberatory possibilities of our interconnected lives. So thank you, and I look forward to dialoguing together.
Hi. Um, thanks to everybody uh, for coming here. Thank you, Arthur, for such a wonderful talk. Um, in the vein of uh, uh, psychological humanities, um, I just wanted to talk briefly um, about uh, humanities um, and, and the relationship between humanities and uh, psychology and, and as a potential uh, uh, solution or help to some of the problems that uh, Dr. Kleinman has um, raised in his talk. Um, so as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to say, um, I was flipping through some old notebooks and came across a quote that I had written down a handful of years ago when I was in the middle of my psychiatry residency. It's a kind of obscure reference. Um, a review by the English professor David Bromwich of a book about the writer and literary critic William Empson. Empson once wrote that when faced with even the most everyday choices, people cannot have done both of two things, but they must have been in some way prepared to have done either. Whichever they did, they will have still lingering in their minds the way that they would have preserved their self-respect if they had acted differently. They are only to be understood by bearing both possibilities in mind. Bromwich then suggests a connection between Empson's conception of ambiguity and the psychological idea of a dynamic unconscious in which we might think of contradictory feelings and desires and impulses flourishing side by side. Our reasons, Bromwich goes on to say, are never identical with our motives. And I think that that is a basic and essential observation, an observation that has been made countless times in countless forms in art and literature long before it also became a clinical insight. So looking at Kleinman's description of caregiving, especially the ideas of relationships, reciprocity, and presence, the importance of a kind of human authenticity is clear. Among other things, this authenticity on the part of the caregiver entails recognizing the full and complicated humanity of the person being cared for. This, in my opinion, is impossible, and therefore good care is impossible, without an appreciation for exactly the kind of thing that Empson and Bromwich are getting at. That to be human is to be divided, divided in relation to ourselves and divided in relation to others. That it is very hard to say what we mean, and that what we say always means more than we think it does that we all have ways of not knowing what we know when to know it would be too painful or contradictory. And that this is both a valuable adaptation and a source of psychological suffering. And yet, as Kleinman describes, uh, the room and motivation for this kind of thinking is being squeezed out of medicine, out of psychiatry, and often out of psychotherapy. So a question that often arises here is, can the humanities be helpful with this problem? Adam Phillips has called psychoanalysis practical poetry, which I have always found both inspiring and a bit unfair to good poetry. <laughs> Similarly, Bromwich notes that Empson once said that a poem is a kind of a clinical object done to prevent the poet from going mad. Helen, Helen Vendler has said that the poetry of William Wordsworth shows human consciousness engaging in constant approximations of occurrences resistant to formulation. And Harold Bloom has called Shakespeare the poet of a psychology of mutability based upon self overhearing, and that the work of great poetry is to aid us to become free artists of ourselves. The connections between literature and psychology are endless, of course. Yet I notice that I'm drawing from literary critics more than usual. And I think that's because they too, like the, clinician, like the clinician, are interested in the practicalities of how words can guide and change us and how art can tune us into the complexities of experience in a useful way. 
Elsewhere, Kleinman himself has addressed the need for exactly this kind of understanding. In an essay entitled The Divided Self, he writes, values tied to emotions require a sensibility about how ourselves and worlds are divided and hide what is most at stake. That few of us in medicine are educated to articulate and deal with hidden and divided values is what I have learned over nearly half a century. And yet in everyday life, this is how most people somehow learn to get along by strategizing over when to reveal and when to conceal the contradictions we inhabit. Hidden and divided values, when unaddressed clinically, can come to undermine personal lives and clinical interactions, creating inauthentic and false scenarios for teaching and for working out policies for caregiving. That's the end of Kleinman's quote. Um, so what does it mean that literature is filled with examples and insights and descriptions of our divided protean selves? In part, I think this means that there is something very real to the related psychological insights and formulations that we try to make use of clinically. I also think that it means art, literature, and other cultural traditions are crucial to the education of caregivers of all sorts, and that it is important to think about how or if they might be included or promoted in formal programs. But I also think that we need to be very careful with how we do that because as soon as we start defining, formalizing, and evaluating something that in essence doesn't lend itself to that sort of thing, what we're left with might not be of much real use to anyone. Thank you. Good evening. It is a real honor to be a respondent uh, to Professor Arthur Kleinman's keynote address. Uh, I want to thank David Goodman for inviting me to this panel. I've been a great admirer of Kleinman's scholarship on rethinking healing, illness, caring, and suffering, and how he delves into the heart of healthcare, advocating for care-centered systems, and challenging the often dehumanizing bureaucracies that sometimes overshadows them. After reading uh, Dr. Kleinman's uh, keynote, I had the simultaneous feeling of being elated and disheartened. I felt uplifted because I wholeheartedly agreed with how Kleinman defines the heart of care as the intersubjective caregiving receiving reciprocity that includes listening, communicating, giving emotional support, and offering caregiving as an ethical and spiritual act. What was disheartening to read uh, in his book, as well as in his keynote, is that our healthcare system has removed the basic components of care from medicine and psychiatry. And these are human relationships, presence, the caring for memories, the everyday activities of pragmatic solidarity, accompaniment, meaning making, and ethical decency. I had two distinct readings to this keynote address. In the first reading, I asked myself, if we have removed these basic acts of caregiving from healthcare, then what is left? What remains when care as a moral and ethical act is fully removed from the healthcare system of medicine and psychiatry? Other Kleinman in his book, The Soul of Care, reminds us about the power of such everyday acts of care. He writes, in quotations, in the humblest of moments of caring, mopping a sweaty brow, changing a soiled sheet, reassuring an agitated person, kissing the cheek of a loved one at the end of life, we may embody the finest versions of ourselves. I further began to wonder whether care and healing as defined by Kleinman has been so completely discarded in our healthcare system that Western biomedicine as a superstructure has itself become a formidable barrier in realizing our finest selves. What if the remedy itself is fully poisoned? I was thinking what kind of revolutionary transformation is needed in medicine and psychiatry and the broader healthcare system so we can include what Kleinman calls an alternative story of care. 
Kleinman and Gardner offer one solution that I thought was an entry point for me to comment on this keynote. Kleinman argues that in order to humanize medicine, we need to change the Meston medical curriculum and incorporate lessons from humanities, arts, and the social science disciplines. I wonder then what does decolonizing or changing or transforming Western medical curriculum look like? A decolonizing approach to teaching psychiatry or medicine is not just about applying a pedagogical technique to the curriculum so it can meet some kind of a diversity requirement or some institutional mandate or a checklist. Rather, the aim to decolonize is to change or decolonize the entire process of knowledge production so we can engage in new relational ways of caring, healing, seeing, and being in the world. Wong Gishin and Lok Gamage argue that arts humanities have taken the steps to decolonize their curriculum, while medical schools have been reluctant to embrace this approach, despite feedback from students, growing activism, and a mobilization from the ground up. This inertia, they note, may be partly attributed to the hegemony of the biomedical perspective in contemporary medicine, based on a hierarchy of knowledge deeply entrenched in colonial history. Dominant systems in biomedicine remain dominant because they have the power to assimilate or erase forms of knowledge that are perceived as indigenous, non-Western, local, cultural, and spiritual. For example, Jogon's scholarship on decolonizing counseling psychology shows that psychotherapy's conception of self and other are anchored in assumptions that differ substantially from the indigenous assumptions of care and healing. He offers an example of the specific healing traditions of the Anai Gross Ventre Indians of Montana and indigenous people of the Northern Great Plains. Jogon writes, and I quote him, consideration of the historical Anai healing tradition will illuminate a subjected realm of health experience in which people's well-being depends on persistent relationships to particular landscapes over time. Of special relevance to decolonization, he says, such traditions frequently assume that much of the natural world is animate and sentient, and that much of the power for maintaining human well-being depends on relationships with beings that inhabit specific places in the world. One of the implications of Gaunt's scholarship and this excerpt that I read out is there are limits to risk reconciling different models of caring and healing and embracing a decolonial framework would require the Western medical curriculum to dramatically transform its foundational understanding of personhood, what evidence means, and how mind and body and healing and caring are deeply connected to places and lands. Indigenous scholarship on healing prompts us to ask this question, what does care and healing in Western medical curriculum look like when we, when we center claims to repatriation and decolonization of land? Using a decolonizing framework means dismantling and undoing the colonial and post-colonial legacies embedded in Western medical knowledge production. It means asking questions about which knowledge is given legitimacy, whose knowledge is considered superior, and how questions of retrieving land are connected to retrieval of knowledge and culture and ethics of care. So shifting from a diversity and inclusion oriented framework to a decolonial framework requires a complete shift in power between Western biomedicine and other forms of indigenous and non-Western practices of care and healing. My second reading of the note was a bit more bleaker. As I read the, re uh, as I re -read the keynote, I wondered when basic acts of care, healing, and attention to human suffering have been so decimated, have we reached a point of no return in our US healthcare system? Can we say the system is really beyond reform or beyond repair? In discussing different types of decolonial futures, indigenous scholar and royalty and her colleagues define three types of reform. Those are soft reform spaces, radical reform spaces, and beyond reform spaces. Each of these spaces has a particular type of enunciation, visions, and tensions, practices, and interventions. Each of these reforms is intended to be in response to what androity and her colleagues call modernity's violence or modernity's shadow. Modernity's shiny or bright side is associated with concepts such as seamless progress, 
industrialization, democracy, secularization, humanism, linear time, scientific reasoning, and nation states, among others. Our healthcare system and the industrial complex of Western biomedicine is the result of modernity's shiny side. Androity and her colleagues reminds us that modernity's shiny size is defined in the way it hides its shadow. Or the fact that the very existence of the shiny side requires the imposition of systematic violence on marginalized others. The darker sides of modernity are indigenous genocide and dispossession, colonialism, black slavery, subjection, as well as exploited labor ecocide, white supremacist and heteropatriarchal immigration policies and compulsory heterosexuality, gendered violence and war and imperialism abroad. So the reforms, soft, radical, and beyond reforms, are intended as frameworks for us to think about how should we respond to the crisis of modernity's dark shadows. And the healthcare system is one of those shadows. And Royty and her colleagues note that there is a no reform space, and it is anchored in the maxim that everything is awesome. And we have never been happier, healthier, or wealthier. And hence, any problems are minor and can be addressed by expanding the existing system or making it more efficient. From that vantage point, our healthcare system in medicine and psychiatry is basically fine and profits are flowing and we just need minor change and tweaking. The soft reform space is about inclusion, diversity and increased access. The radical reform space is about redistribution of power, recognition, and different kinds of healing systems. The beyond reform spaces means that all systems of modernity have declined so much that they are on palliative care. And they have reached what Andreotti calls the stage of hospicing. Their definition of hospicing is based on three insights, and they're very applicable to our discussion of the decline of healthcare and the absence of caring that Professor Kleinman spoke about. And I quote Andrew Andriotti here now to discuss in the end what these three insights we get when we think of healthcare medicine on, um, the, on hospicing. They argue our definition of hospicing entails three different insights. One, that the modern global capital system is unsustainable and that is already collapsing. Two, that our current languages, identities, and sense making are inescapably historically connected to it. Three, that we need to be properly taught by the system's success and failures by facing its death and attending to its application affliction rather than turning up back or attempting to murder it before it is ready to go. Hospicing and acts, a willingness to learn enough from the recurrent mistakes of the current system in order to make different mistakes in caring for the arrival of something new, end quote. So if our current healthcare system is on palliative care and hospicing and beyond reform, then we must ask whether integrating community, family, relational, and moral notion of care practices is enough to reverse this course in the anticipation of something new, or do we need some other alternatives to align ourselves, our healthcare systems, with what Professor Kleinman uh, gave us, the characteristics of what makes good healthcare and caring. Alas, I don't have any answers or guarantees, just have readings and responses. And I hope at this point, these readings will be enough to generate a conversation. Thank you. OK, so I think we open it up to audiences for questions in right now. Oh, there's a mic over there, yes. Um, hi, Dr. Kleiman, and I just uh, wanted to follow up on, a, on a, a very important point that you made, uh, which is that we don't have resilience. And you asked the question, what do we have? And I was wondering if you came up with something for you about what you had. 
had trouble hearing it. I've got a little. Hearing. I'll. Sp I, I. I know how to speak loudly, though. Okay, so I'll. I'll uh, repeat it. Thank you for telling me. Okay, so you. Um, what you mentioned resilience. I think. I think you said it's bullshit. I believe that's the word you used. If I got you, and that we don't have resilience, but you pose the question. We have something else. Did you find for yourself what you have? What word do you use for what got you through um, that you know, challenging experience with your wife? If not resilience, what got you through? Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that's an excellent question. And um, the, the term I used was enduring, endurance. And I'll tell you where it came from. So I do a lot of my research in Chinese society. I've lived in uh, either China or Taiwan for seven and a half years. I spent 50 years, more than 50 years, studying uh, Chinese society. Um, the Chinese uh, traditionally had the idea that life was very difficult based on the actual realities of that life. So if, so if you go back to 1949, for example, in China, before the communist revolution, the infant mortality in Beijing was 500 deaths per thousand live births. That means that ever that half of that one out of every two children born died before the first the end of their first year of life. The country was in total chaos, and one and although uh, the Communist Party has has introduced many problems that we see today. Their great achievement was raising 800 million people out of poverty, okay? unprecedented. Now, the wisdom in Chinese society is expressed in a, in a phrase. I don't, are there any Chinese speakers here? OK, you'll know this phrase then. Yaba, chur wang lian, lai. Okay, be deaf and dumb. Eat the, the seeds of the bitter melon. Don't speak out. Okay. That was part of enduring. How do you endure under the Qing dynasty? How do you endure under the Japanese occupation? How do you endure under um, a, a repressive communism? Um, we have our own wisdoms for enduring. How do we endure? How do we endure the kinds of things that we go through in our society? We should be building an understanding of that. In, uh, in the spring, uh, in spring term, I teach a course with um, uh, three colleagues at Harvard. The course is called uh, Quest for Wisdom, Aesthetic, Moral, Religious. My three colleagues are David Carrasco, a great historian of religion, Michael Pewitt, a great student of uh, classical Chinese culture, and uh, Stephanie Paulsell, a wonderful uh, theologian at Harvard Divinity School. And what we, we have no wisdom to convey. The course is about encouraging people to have the courage to follow through on their quests with the idea that the wisdom we find is going to be particular to our social circumstance, to our particular the particularities of our life. But surely one of those, one of the wisdoms is what does it take to endure? How do we, how do we endure? I found that my enduring came out of my relationship with my wife. She brought something out of me. She drew it from me. If you know Leonard Cohn's yeah. Hallelujah, that's exactly what I think Leonard Cohn meant, um, that something is drawn from us, that presence is not what we have, it's what is between us, brought out of us. You know, that's exactly, by the way, what Max Weber meant by charisma. He didn't believe that charisma was something that only the charismatic person had. He believed that charisma was the ability of a charismatic person 
to draw something out of followers that was between them. And so, I mean, in this sense, our presence is interpersonal. It's transpersonal. It's right between us. It's, it's binding us. And I think that's what kept me going. I wrote the foreword to a book, a very interesting book called The, Care, the, Care, the Caregiver by E.S. Goldman. E.S. Goldman was a writer for The New Yorker whose wife developed Alzheimer's, though Alzheimer's in later life, not early onset, as in my case. And he, he took care of her for uh, a year before she died, a, f a few years. And um, this book did very well and, uh, the, um, in, in Cambridge, in Porter Square, there's a um, bookstore um, and he gave a talk in the bookstore and I went with him because at this time he was 93 years of age, frail, with a walker. And he gave this wonderful talk about being a care, caregiver. And a young woman in the audience raised her hand and she said, um, uh, I don't quite understand. Why did you do it? It was so hard to do. It was so frustrating. You told us all the difficulties. Why did you do it? And he, he was, you could see that uh, E.S. Goldman was completely taken aback by the question. And he said, why? He said, it was there to do. It was there to, that was the, those were the vows. That was the relationship. She did it for me, I did it for her. I could say the same thing in my relationship. Joan took care of me for 36 years. If you read the book, you'll see that very clearly. I took care of her for 10, hardly enough of a payback in that regard. But it's, it's, it is there to do. None of us, you know, this is the problem I have, for example, with rational choice theory, or with decision uh, analysis. None of us really make choices. Um, you know, um, we, you do it, you end up doing something. You try to figure out later rationally, why did I do that, okay? But it's because we, it was there to do. You did it, something compelled you to do it, something felt that that was the thing to do. Um, I, in anthropology, we try to distinguish between the moral and the ethical. By the moral, we mean the experience that you have in your everyday life. The ethical is your aspiration for something beyond that experience. So you're caught up in a clinical practice and you have a big motto on the world that's a wall that says, serve the people. But if you actually look at what's happening in that clinical practice, you can see that patients are regarded as profit centers and people are generating funds. There's a discrepancy then, this divided self that Caleb so beautifully talked about. There's a discrepancy between what you see people's actions reflecting and what they themselves say. That discrepancy, that gap, it seems to me, that divided, that division, is not just a division in the self, it's a division between the self and our social circumstance. It's a division between our society and our communities. In that, that is where we appeal to something beyond the local. What we experience in the local is our moral life. What we appeal to is an ethical aspiration to find something beyond the local. And that's in this case, what endurance is about. So endurance is about somehow surviving in the context of the local. But you're asking the more difficult question, which is, what goes be where, where is that founded? What is the extension of that that relates to others? Where does that come from? What is that endurance based in? And my answer to that is that it's based in relationships, that it's coming out of relationships. Yes, it's coming out of love. Well, what is care? Care is love. Care, professional care too is a form of love. Yeah, but let me turn it over to my colleagues to, to, to say some things. Please. No, Batio gave such a brilliant response. Take, take one. Oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add is um, 
um, sort of this, like there are private acts of love and there are public acts of love. And it reminds me of Cornel West's quote that justice is what love looks like in public. And, 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 it, and we don't have those kinds of systems, uh, our institutions, our state, our policies that promote that kind of public love. So therefore we have to fall back on these private acts that are interpersonal, but also they can be kind of the opposite. That is, it can be also demanding and very exhausting. So I sometimes hesitate to, 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 to romanticize caring because the other aspect of caring is sometimes even interpersonally, you don't necessarily have the energy or, or the strength to go forward. You know, what happens when it completely breaks you? And if you don't have any fallback systems, either in the family or in the community, then what? And so this is, this is something I, I think, you know, Professor Kleinman's book, The Soul of Care, uh, really brings out at what level you become really completely destitute of care. And, and you know, and many scholars have called it, 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 you know, speaking about it as it's like bare citizenship, where there is no means for you to acquire any form of care. And I think that's something um, uh, we don't necessarily only have to rely on private acts that are based on, say, our class system and so on, those of access to wealth, you know, financial arrangements and so on. They, these cares, these acts have to be distributed across different domains. And we haven't yet figured out how to do that. This one, okay. Um, yes, well, uh, tough acts to follow. But I, I, the, I think one thing that comes to my mind is, you know, we, we have Dr. Kleinman here talking about the divided self, the, the difference between, um, you know, reasons and motives. You're talking about love. We're wondering, you know, where that comes from, but also knowing on a very personal level what that is. Um, and, um, and, and also Dr. Klein is talking about, you know, wisdom. So there, there are some basic things we know about being ourselves and being human and what motivates us, even if we don't necessarily, you know, know the details of it. Um, and, and I think that we can all kind of take that for granted to a certain degree. And so when you're in, so this is sort of me speaking from my sort of, you know, uh, psychiatry having been a psychiatry resident perspective and a medical student when you're in a system that sort of denies that kind of nuance but the kind of things that we all know deeply and makes you sort of come up with reasons for things that you can't really come up with reasons for um I, that it can be particularly corrosive so i think that that's you know one of the um th that all of the sort of wonderful things that are being discussed here is the other side of the coin is how um, how corrosive it can be when those are kind of tacitly uh, denied in in a in a training program in a healthcare delivery system things like that. Please. Yeah, so I think a lot about clinical theory and practice, and I once had a mentor frame caregiving as a psychotherapist as. Uh, really positioning yourself as an exquisite instrument of resonance, resonance with the other person. And I, I liked the musicality of that language. It brings up the humanities that Caleb was talking about. Um, but it also makes me think about what it means to resonate with the other and not just then the courage to be, to pull on an existential dictum, but the courage to uh, relate in a way where you would confront parts of yourself that otherwise might be scary or threatening and to be able to see that in the other person, even when it challenges you. So there's love, but there's also a type of courage. And when I draw from liberation psychology, 
it puts forward notions of critical consciousness that it's within one's lived experience and from their positionality in the world that they might have the most incisive insights into the ways that they suffer or their own sort of soul wound and that when you are sitting with someone or accompanying them which is both a liberation psychology term but also i think a musical one when you're accompanying someone in that you don't know where it's going uh, and you are discovering that with them and it is by exploring the nature of that lived experience and trusting that critical consciousness that then new possibilities open up. So the beauty of relationships being the site where care is founded means that there's a thirdness, that something else is actually born in between people too. And that's another possibility that comes from love in a way, but also the, the courage to face those divisions, the divided self and the divisions with other. Um, yeah, so that's what comes up for me. If, before we get another question, I, I think that's, that's just a terrific answer. And it reminds me of something that Paul Farmer used to say. Paul Farmer said, drawing on liberation theology, that the problem of the world was that some people were regarded as lesser. And I think that the implication of that for what we're talking about is that there really is no moral high ground. The therapist is not in a moral plane different from the patient. The doctor is not at a moral plane different from the patient. The sick family member is not on a different moral plane than the other family members. We're all in this together. I think if we learn something in the course of life, it is precisely that, that we're all in this together. We go somewhere in the world where there are people who are in desperate circumstances. They're not other. We are them, we are with them. That's what solidarity means. And I think that liberation theology has an enormous amount to give to us as healers in terms of coming to that radical democratic perspective. And I think that's also what Professor Bhatia was talking about when it comes to the idea of decolonizing. What, what is really decolonizing, but making it clear that we are all in this together, that there's no colonizer and there's no one who's colonized. Let's have other questions. We have time for one more quick question because we're at time, unfortunately. So we'll go to, to Winston down here and I, I can- No, wait a minute. Professor I thought Kleiman. this meeting was, was based on Fidel Castro's idea of the four, of the four hour, the four hour session. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm staying here. <laughs> please, please. Doctor, thank you for sharing your pain. I um, just reflect on the experience you shared with us that went beyond training, beyond professionalism, and the pain of recounting the memories and showing them to us. I imagine um, there is uh, not a, any numbness at all, which is often a de defense against dealing with that pain consistently. So I deeply appreciate your, your openness to again go through what you have been through. My only question is, what do you find helpful as you endure, as you work through the pain, and as you teach us from that place in your life. Well, thank you for that's a wonderful question. And um, uh, well, let me respond to it um, uh, this way. Um, uh, I know a woman who was a survivor of the Holocaust. Um, she was 11 years old when her family was taken to the death camps and she survived Auschwitz. Um, she wrote a, a wonderful book uh, called Saying the Names, the importance of, for her, of memory of the names of people, keeping them alive, not letting them disappear. Um, 
although that's an extreme case, as is the experience of um, slavery, as is the experience of um, the ethnocide of, uh, of American Indians, et cetera, I think we all in some way have within us um, a domain of injury and hurt that reflects uh, aspects of our own experience. I think that's what um, uh, uh, Dr. Gardner as, a, um, as an outstanding clinician and psychoanalyst is talking about in terms of the divided self. But one of the divisions I think in the self is a division between two types of memory. Um, cognitive neuroscientists tell us that all memory is based in interpretation as we retrieve the traces at the time that we are remembering, remembering. But if you speak to people who've been in, who've come out of things like uh, uh, deep trauma, like the Holocaust, they claim that that's not the case. They claim that they live on two tracks and that they can return in their own memories to the presence that they felt when something terrible was going on, like being in the death camps. There's a wonderful book written about this by, uh, uh, by, by uh, uh, Lawrence Langner called um, The Holocaust Testimonies, The Ruins of Memory. I think that that's a division between two types of memory. And, and when it comes to my own experience <coughs> of caregiving with Joan, I can actually return sometimes to almost feel exactly, I think, as I felt when, and the worst of days that I had, um, when I felt I cannot survive this. Okay. I remember um, on July 4th, 2010, um, the year before uh, Joan died, um, I have a house in Maine. And I drove her up to the house in Maine. I knew it was uh, 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 taking a chance because um, she hadn't been there for some time. And when she was in circumstances that were not familiar, she would become very, very upset. I drove us up there. It was a beautiful day. Um, I uh, started grilling hot dogs and, and, um, and hamburgers. I uh, uh, opened uh, uh, a bottle of champagne and uh, all of a sudden Joan became terribly agitated, terribly agitated. And I, I realized that she couldn't stay there. And so I had to quickly close things down and drive back to Cambridge, our house in Cambridge, which is a three and a half hour drive. And as we started, down a road called S Road, which is close to our, our house, getting us to the to Route 129. Um, Joan started fiddling with the handle of the door on her side, and I felt, oh my goodness, you know, she opens the door, we're in real trouble. So I had to reach across and put her hands on my leg and held her hands with my right hand while I drove with my left hand, okay? I drove three and a half hours back, so that's seven hours of driving, okay? When I get home, she was so delirious and out of it. She was throwing things, rolling on the floor, screaming. Because in the end stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease, the issue is not cognitive change, it's behavioral change. And, and basically a state that borders between delirium and psychosis. And at that stage, she fell to the floor and started rolling on the floor. And I dropped to the floor myself and I, I said, 
I, I don't think I can go on from this point. I don't think I can, I can do it. And somehow we got through that night. I, she fell asleep, and I invited a friend over who was a great geriatric psychiatrist to help me think through what was going to happen now. Because frankly, I could not come to terms with the fact that I could no longer take care of her at home. Um, in fact, that was probably my failure, that I, I could not envision that she would leave home, that I would not be able to care for her any longer. For me, that was the most difficult thing. Well, that feeling of despair, I can go right back to that right now. As I tell you the story, I could allow myself, but I'm not, to go right to that place, okay? At the same time that I can curate memories which I know are my interpretations of things as cognitive neuroscientists say. So what does that say? That says that cognitive neuroscientists don't have the whole story, okay? That there's some aspect of experience that relates to trauma. I think um, this is what people working on PTSD are quite familiar with. That is some, about another kind of memory, a set of memories. Memories that bring us back to a terrible space. And so this question then becomes, how do you negotiate between these? Okay. How do you deal with them? And I've, you know, I'm, I, 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 I give talks like this frequently. And for me, the way I deal with them is I don't go to that space where, that puts me into that feeling. I have a way now of being able to talk about it without going there, without being there. And I think all of us learn in some way how to, how to do that. And I believe that that is part of the caring of memories. It's not just curating memories. It's learning which memories are so deeply dangerous that we have to modulate the way we handle them. And, um, and I think that's the kind of thing that I expect some young person in the audience here will work out for us and I'm at the end of my life, but in your lives, uh, you'll read about this and, and we'll make headway in it. Um, because we're not just here to talk about failure and that it's impossible to endure and that we're not gonna get through this. We're here to talk about the fact we do get through it. In fact, maybe the I'm going to tell you something that sounds bleak, but it's true. Maybe the great human danger is we can endure everything. Okay, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm.